view of the valleys between the ridges of the Appalachian Mountains in Letcher County, Kentucky is a breathtaking example of the beauties of nature. Letcher County is located in the very heart of Appalachia in what is known as Central Appalachia. This region has a rich history of faith, family, worth ethic, service, and perseverance that is often forgotten or made fun of. Through numerous documentaries and media exposes dating back to the early 1960s, this region has been unfairly viewed in a negative light, focused only on the problems and challenges of the region and with very little mention of the positives that are nurtured in the traditional mountain culture. It is true that traditionally this region has and is riddled with poverty, poor health, and substance abuse issues. However, these are challenges not isolated to the mountain. They are societal problems that are present across our nation and world. So why is there such a negative stigma assigned to the people and culture of southeastern Kentucky? The reason is twofold. One being the national media coverage that was part of Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty and the subsequent visits by the national media, and the failure of the inhabitants of southeastern Appalachia to promote the positives that dispel the negative stereotypes. This documentary showcases a collection of mountain people who have lived through times of poverty and hardship, but have persevered to be an example to all. We, uh, we raised just about everything that we eat. Uh, life was fun. I, I had, a, had a great childhood. Wouldn't trade with anybody that, that I know of. Uh, we worked a lot uh, in the garden, uh, milked cow, uh, uh, made preparation for food. We raised most everything we ate. Positive memories. Uh... I don't have many negative memories because we didn't seem to dwell on problems, but we dwelt on success of figuring out a way to do things, to make it work. And families were close. And uh, it's not like today where you have so many kids that grow up in a one parent home and so forth. So I grew up in the Depression and before the World War II. And uh, the thing that impressed me most as I looked back was there was a, a quality of peace about your life. You were not bothered by the outside world. You had no way to communicate with them or they to you at that point. And uh, world problems were be like going to the moon, you know. Uh, and I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of positive things in my life. And, and later on, like we got a, we got up in the chips a little bit and bought an old car of some kind. My dad did. <laughs> but uh, we had, we had, we shared the car together. But, uh, wasn't very many people had a car, and I'm not uh, sticking our chest out one bit at all. It just was able to run, you know. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't look at it that way. Uh, we had to do certain things to survive. We had to farm. We had to raise gardens. We had to can. We took care of washing our own clothes. We didn't have running water, so we ran to the well to get water. We didn't have electricity uh, for a while. And, uh, but it was no problem. We had lamps. In the daylight, we got up at daylight and went to work, and worked dark, and went to bed. And uh, that's pretty much the way it was. You knew what you had to do to survive. Again, uh, we worked a lot. We played a lot. Uh, there was uh, not organized sports. I don't know that we ever, I don't know if we ever had a basketball or a football or or something like that, but we made our own games. Uh, we uh, visited in the neighborhood a lot. Uh, I guess television has kind of taken that very positive thing away, I think. Uh, we knew our neighbors, we ate with our neighbors, we uh, uh, interacted helped each other out. Sometimes if they had a lot of work to do that we would go help them work. 
<clears throat> when we had a lot of work, they might come and help us work. Uh, there was a, I guess the word is camaraderie that uh, uh, was unique and, and I think very good for society. Uh, I cherish those memories. Uh, People visited one another back then, a lot more than what they do now, and uh, things were a lot different back in them days than what they are right now. We never, uh, we never did have running water. We didn't have inside bathrooms or anything like that. So we had to work in order to survive. We more or less we uh, raised what we eat and eat what we raised. After you eat breakfast, she said, "Don't come back till you hear the uh, lunch bell ring." And we had to entertain ourselves, and we were really good at that. Uh, playing in the creek, playing in the branch, uh, catching crawdads, you know, for future use. Uh, just all kinds of uh, different wonderful games that we, uh, some of them created. The weather would be cold, you know, in our house back then. They wasn't, they wasn't insulated good like they are now, you know. And of course, we had a, we had a fireplace, you know, two fireplaces, and it had a cold uh, heat, you know. But so it's, uh, it was just a pretty rough life growing up. Probably the isolation. Uh, I think now, probably you folks. Uh, have acquaintances and know people kind of far ranging. Uh, we uh, did not because we didn't have much of an opportunity to go there. If, uh, if I visited my cousins that were five miles away, it was a pretty good trip to walk the five miles there and, and the five miles back. Uh, so there was some isolation, but uh, uh, within our neighborhood and within our close, our, our family that lived nearby, there was a special relationship that we cultivated uh, and used. Games, if we played games, we kind of invented our own game. We didn't have electricity at our house. As a matter of fact, I was in the fifth grade before electricity came into our neighborhood. So uh, when it got dark, we went to bed and uh, when it got daylight, then we, we got up. We had a radio that was operated by a battery, and uh, we didn't use it very much. There was probably 30 minutes in the afternoon, uh, we, would, we would listen to a, a, a comedy at the time, it was called Lum and Abner. They were two fellas that had a store, and, and it was, was comical, uh, but then, we would listen to the news. I grew up during World War II, and so that was very, very uh, meaningful to us. We were working from daylight until four or five o'clock in the afternoon when the shade reached a certain point coming down the mountain, that's quitting time. And uh, I don't know, it's, uh, you didn't view them as hardships. It was almost just like breathing. It had to, it had to be. You, you did it because you had to. And I don't mean by having to that they made you get up and do these things. It's that you realized that there were certain things that had to be done every day. I had to milk the cow in the morning before I went to school. In the winter time, well three miles to the elementary school, walked three miles back, never missed a day for snow. Yes, we scraped by. Uh, my father had died. I uh, he was killed when I was just turned six years old. It was uh, Rick Vandetta. And I drew off him $66 a month, Social Security, and Mom drew $66 a month, and that was what we lived on. And $50 of my check Went to that old place I currently still live at today, up ahead of Purpose Bridge. We bought the old uh, farm up there. And uh, my uncle gave it to me for $600, $50 a month till paid. And uh, I had to 
sometimes go out and ask the neighbor to work. And, uh, there were times that I'm not proud of that uh, uh, I would take without asking and uh, like going to a cornfield, give him a couple of ears of corn and stuff. And, uh, I did apologize to George years later, but uh, you know, at the time I was hungry and that's no excuse for taking something that don't belong to you. But uh, yeah, uh, my stepdad worked some, but uh, he had such a uh, alcohol problem that uh, there's no money. And uh, you know, it, it was a day by day struggle, but uh, uh, Mom always told me, said, uh, we're not uh, poor, we just don't have any money. And that, for some reason that stuck in my mind, you know, to keep that pride, because she would not take anything uh, unless she earned it. I always got along pretty good with them. Uh, my part, I was a little bit mischievous, I guess, with them. They, they, they said a lot. And but uh seemed like I was a little bit outspoken to some of you know and I wasn't I wasn't a little backward boy you might call it. I was always out front and had something to say or do. Sometimes a little mischievous thing, you know, like the young children do when they're growing up. I wonder how I made it. You know, somebody had me looking over me and I didn't have a that function to know it, to realize. But I'll tell you right now, the old man upstairs, he's a good man to work with. Lord, I would take nothing in the world for my change in life. But I'll see him again. Well, really, the value system is greatly instilled in you with your parents. But I learned early on that uh, you were quiet in church. My mother was quite religious. Uh, my dad was. And I've always had an appreciation for the Bible and the, the structure that it gives our lives. Uh, if you live by the Ten Commandments, you, you're living a pretty good life. I don't care who you are, where you are, or whatever. And, uh, but she, she was quite religious. And of course, we went to the old regular Baptist churches. And back then, when you went on Saturday, you went for the day. You know, they start at nine and go to four, and uh, and they pay no overtime. <laughs> I think there's there's things that are different. We worked hard, and we respected those that worked hard, and and actually didn't respect those that didn't work hard. But certainly, we were taught to be honest, to tell the truth, uh, and mostly to help our neighbors. We had a neighbor uh, in trouble. Uh, we would go and help them out. Uh, I remember that if, if that there were some neighbors uh, on their deathbed, uh, my dad used to go and sit up with them even at night uh, and maybe let some of the family rest. Uh, of course, there were not hospitals then like there are now. Uh, but uh, those are some special values I think would do us pretty good today. Parents were, were deacons in, in a local church uh, and, and, and they were in the old regular Baptist church uh, and so uh, religion and Christianity was a very strong part of our growing up. My father would often come in from working in the fields and sit on the front porch and, and sing songs for a, a while and sometimes the, the neighbors uh, around would come out on their porch and listen as he would sing and of course that had an impact on us. Uh, uh, Sundays we went to church uh, and and uh, there again I would very, I'd very much cherish uh, that value, uh, that value of, of the church relationship that it's had on my life. It was very, very important for we was taught to do right from wrong, you know. And I can remember people going back and forth to church, walking up and down Toby there, 
coming across the mountain, coming to Blackie down there. And I remember people stopping by our home and eating Sunday dinner from church. And uh, their conversation would be on what a good meeting they had and so forth. I didn't have the education that a lot of the lawyers had there, but I had some good common sense. Well, the thing I think the advantage of, of, of my elementary education compared to what we do today is that uh, we had a two-room school. Uh, half of the school was first, second, third, and fourth, maybe just third. And the rest of the school was fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And you were in a class with 8th graders and 7th graders or whatever level you were at, you had these other classes in there and the teacher would teach these different classes at different times and you were always listening. You know, you could hear the, you could hear the 8th grade math lesson and watch them do their problems on the board and you could practice your writing skills at the same time. So there, there was something that was very desirable and if you were in the fifth grade, you could also be in the eighth grade. All you had to do was listen and pay attention. It helped you tremendously. We didn't have any electricity. We did have a, a chalkboard and some chalk, but that was about the extent of it. We had uh, uh, textbooks by and large. Uh, and basically what we had was a textbook and a desk and a big pot-bellied stove and, and uh, uh, there was no lunch program at, when I was in school. Uh, but still yet we learned a lot. There were no electronics uh, and therefore I'm pretty much lost. So I'm impressed with what you guys know and do and and can do with, with all of that. Uh, we had some good teachers and some poor teachers. Uh, we probably memorized a whole lot more then than people do uh, now. They had paddling back in them days and they didn't hesitate about using it either. I mean, if you got out of line. And uh, everybody, all the students, rode the buses. They didn't have any cars or anything to drive back and forth. To school. One thing, well, didn't have the roads either. Back to 1930, I'm in there. It took the toll on everybody. That depression did. It made everything rough and hard to. But even the little stuff we had to buy out of the store, it made it more difficult. But you just remember that uh, there were things that. Uh, that and the war kind of were close together in my own mind and of course the war everything was rationed You know you could only get just a little bit of sugar a month. You couldn't get this, you couldn't get that because they used it in the uh, in the war effort, but I just remember during the depression there was there was characters that were homeless And there were no programs to serve the homeless at that time so People in the community would take them in for a week or two, and they'd come in and live. And, uh, and if you had a little bit of work you could get out of them, get them to do, then uh, that's the thing I remember mostly about the Depression, because we still raised the same garden, canned the same foods, and ate like we always did. We raised hogs, had milk cows, and uh, I, could, I could see really no difference. The Great Depression was a uh, very serious time. It probably didn't impact uh, our family as much as it did many others for uh, people who lived in cities and had no place to, uh, to grow their food and so forth. Uh, I'm sure many people starved. Uh, before the Depression, uh, basically, uh, we raised most of what we would eat, 
from from the vegetables and we preserved them and we uh, uh, had cattle and 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 and, and milk and and, and uh, hogs and we slaughtered them and had uh, all the meat that we would need and so uh, the depression did make some difference in what uh, you could buy in terms of clothes and shoes and so forth, but it probably didn't impact us as much as it did those that totally depended on some outside employment uh, that really put some people in a very bad way. I told him I'd leave and join the army. I believe uh, about 1940, I guess. I know I served every for 1940. I lined up to go to be shipped overseas. And somehow they got me transferred to the States. In mean, no particular places, transferred to the States. Of course, my mother had a stroke, and uh, she was real sick at an early age. Uh, big line of soldiers. They called my name. There's about three of us out of several hundred, and uh, they called me out. And I didn't didn't have to go overseas, but I was still being in the service, and. Uh, Lucky, here I go again, I had an old guitar there on that post there. And I kind of kept up with a bunch of the boys and so forth. They thought I was playing good. I didn't, I, I didn't think I was that good at all. If I made a noise by an old guitar, they were satisfied with it, you know. And then they shipped me down to uh, Fort Lee, Maryland. Detached service, they call it. That's, uh, that any, they can take you and put you in anything they want to. So they made a police, military police out of me. And uh, me and another boy, we rode motorcycles together on patrol. That's when this, this war broke out there. It was building barracks there in Fort B. Maryland, extended and made a big, bigger place out of it. I remember, and I went into the tank outfit. Armored to be. I was going to bring a picture of that tank and pull out it. So I guess I'm going to get ahead of myself here. But my nail fair life was, it was something else. It seemed like I'd done pretty good at that. Anything I was put at, you know, I'd done my job good. I was always mischievous and done things I should have done, you know. But as far as the service is concerned, I'd done it just the way it's supposed to be done. I could figure out about anything I wanted to figure out. And they them educated because they had it all on paper, but you take it off of paper, they, 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 they didn't have it. A lot of things, they talk about these wars and so forth. But I went up to uh, Iceland. I spent 21 months up in Iceland. Isolated place. And cold. You see the midnight sun, just like a ball of fire. We, we, we took uh, 20 light tanks, 20 uh, P-38 fighter planes, and a bunch of ground troops. Took us all along board the ship. We spent, uh, we spent 21 months up on the ice room. There wasn't a whole lot to do there. We, we just go to school, right over and over and over in our training. We had a, had to strip our machine guns down and explain what they was. Like, a, well, well, my tank had a, well, they all had the same amount of firepower in them, but uh, like a round machine gun, Cavalry 30 model 1994 HB, our belt, they had recoil operated. We had to get it word by word. They saw them federal, they couldn't remember that. They couldn't figure that out. <laughs> like a job would come over there. <clears throat> Reykjavik was a capital of Iceland, and Hafnafjörður was a 
is where the bummer field is at that we must go. He needs a driver to hold water in the night from the hopping here to the wreck of it. And he had to put a water tank behind the truck. Well, the three 4 of us went out there and I had a little problem with ship. They couldn't figure out how to do it. They couldn't see that tank and he couldn't, couldn't figure out how to drive by looking through the mirrors on each side, you see. I went for the dump or somewhere there and got me two big brooms that wore out. I put on each corner of that water tank. It stuck up there and I could see it. So I got the job. Once again, I outsmarted something. They had a good education, but they didn't. They just didn't have the common sense to get their way through it. I do a lot of airplanes. Fighter planes, that was my big thing back then. I can remember that so well. And uh, the war was, even though I wasn't old enough to, to be in the war, but the, we all did what we could to help out, which means we, well, I can remember aluminum foil. Uh, they would, everybody would save aluminum foil. You would have rolls, big balls of it that maybe would be this high. And that was used in the, to foil the radar uh, on bombing runs. You know, they'd go through and drop this aluminum foil and it would slowly settle to the ground. And then the radar that was picking up the airplanes without the aluminum foil, of course, they were able to bring up the artillery. We didn't have the news access to the war. That, you know, if, if somebody in the community was killed, it may be a month before we ever knew it. And uh, I'm not sure if it was like that in New York or they had more communications, I'm sure, but we had very, very poor communication when it came to the war. World War II had a tremendous impact on us. I had a an older brother, Pearl Harbor was bombed and therefore the United States got into the uh, war right after December the 7th in 1941. Back in October of that year, I've heard the term that the war clouds were hanging low. It was pretty obvious, I was too young, but it was pretty obvious to detect the adults that they knew that a very serious war was, was probably imminent. My older brother in October was drafted and, and he, of course, left for the Army. And I remember that the railroad goes right by our house and he had uh, gone to Whitesburg to check in and then those soldiers, those that were drafted, uh, rode the train down by our house and I remember that uh, uh, that brother got out between the coaches and as they went by our house and I would have been about four years old uh, but it had a great impact on me because I can remember my mother crying as he rode by there and he was in a lot of action in the Battle of the Bulge he was shot through the leg and uh, he did not get to come home on a furlough for four years and when he came home, uh, I would have been about four when he left and eight when he came back and I had no idea who he was. I you know, just did not recognize him. I had a, the next brother left in July in 42, I guess. And uh, he was a, a waste gunner and a bomber and was uh, shot down over, over Hungary actually. And that was after Germany had conquered Hungary and he was taken as a prisoner of war and spent 10 months in a German prison camp. And in the month of February, the Allies were invading Germany and getting close to that prison camp. So the Germans loaded, had hauled most of the prisoners away, but this last group of 2,500, they started marching them away from the Allied army just so they could not be rescued and uh, they marched them just here and there until they were liberated in uh, probably May, I guess. So from February to May, he never had a bath. He never had a change of clothes. They were infested with lice. 
they started them out with no food and whatever they could find along the way uh, they might have food or they might and sometimes they would go for days without food. He was uh, probably 6'2 or more and when he got uh, liberated he weighed 90 pounds and uh, it had an effect on him the rest of his life I think had another brother that was in uh, that was drafted and he was assigned kind of an office job in England but you see uh, Germany began had taken over France and they were trying to take England and and they just started bombing the place so day after day after day, they bombed England. That they all three got back, but had a great impact. My uncles, one of them had pretty well destroyed him. World War II. Uh, uh, some of the stories that I have of him, uh, uh, he was a drill sergeant for a man by the name of Holly Murphy, according to family legend tradition. Uh, he was wounded. Uh, Uncle Harley. He was wounded severely in Korea and had an impact because these were warriors. I called them the fly, Fighting Blairs, Uncle Arnold. A few years after his death, his uh, widow received a letter from Germany. They had found his dog tags and wondered that he, she wanted them back. And he, she'd been in such intense fighting and stuff. But the, the war, I guess that made me more patriotic because we, from Revolutionary War all the way up to current day, we've had someone willing to sacrifice, willing to give their all for this thing called America freedom. And to me, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of everyone I'm for serving and uh, my mother for willing to go up and, you know, it, it wasn't just about the men. And uh, thank goodness the military as well. Uh, awakened to the idea that women can do just a good job, if not better, uh, than men in the service of our country. Well, the first radio I saw in the community, my dad had it, and it was a battery radio, and it had it seemed to me like it had three batteries that would have been almost as big as a suitcase that you put your clothes in. I mean, they were huge batteries. And, uh, but I can also remember on Saturday night, everybody in the community would come out there and listen to the Grand Ole Opry at the Dad's house. And uh, it, was, it was something to, to hear. Renfro Valley. And people couldn't believe that uh, we could hear Renfro Valley all the way from London, Kentucky. It's just out of our reach. Our grasp just didn't quite take it in. Now, TV, the thing I remember most about the television, we had a television when they first appeared. But uh, the only way you could get a picture on it, and we could get some sound sometimes. You couldn't see the picture, but you could hear it. And that was kind of fun, too. You, you could use your own imagination of what was going on. But we had to run this, what we call, track wire. It looked like a railroad track. Two wires and plastic crossbars. And we'd have to go to the highest point we could find and put up a big antenna and run that line all the way off. And sometimes you'd be running it a mile and a half. And every time the wind would blow. <laughs> Back to the hill, because your television went out. We had to drop a limb on it. But we, could, we got very little reception. Seemed like we got a, maybe Huntington, West Virginia. We had one or two stations. We might have got a Lexington station. I'm not sure. But it was very limited what we could pull in. Dad had a car, as far as I could remember back. Uh, he had a Model A Ford. I can remember that. And uh, it was a coupe, it was green, had a rumble seat on the back, it was sharp. I mean, it was, it was, it was a sharp little car. That's my first uh, car I remember. I, I do remember something that's kind of strange. When those older cars first came out, 
instead of the doors opening from the back of the door, they opened from the front of the door and swung out like this. And I remember I was leaning up against the door going back to down the ice into the house with Dad one day. And up on Sand Lake, there's a huge stiff curve up there on the old road. And uh, he went around that curve and that door came open and I just went shoo, head first into a big pile of road gravel. <laughs> and that was kind of tremendous. Uh, I remember that uh, after the war, World War II, uh, I had some brothers who went to Louisville, Kentucky to get a job and work there. And uh, they uh, took me home with them for a week or two, uh, a few times. Uh, and I remember uh, going with my brother, uh, it may have been a bar or something like that as I think back on it. Uh, but uh, we went there and here was this moving picture that supposedly they said was a picture of somebody way off and yet you could see it on that screen there. Uh, and I was absolutely amazed that it would be possible to uh, uh, show somebody in a different place on that screen uh, in, in that location. But it was in Louisville and, and that would have been, I don't know, 19... 46 or so, I guess. So that'd be my first <coughs> encounter with television. Uh, we did have a radio when I can first remember, uh, and that was primarily because my folks were very concerned uh, about the war effort, and they wanted to know what was happening in terms of that war effort. Well, it made, us, it made us dependent on the government. Instead of being self-dependent, we were dependent on the government. And that's, I think that's a, that's a terrible hoax that uh, they played on us then. It's grown all the time. It's never been rescinded at all. And I think it took a lot of our pride away from us. And I think it took a lot of uh, our willpower to get it to work. You know, we found a way to make a living when I was growing up, and we didn't have uh, we didn't have government assistance. And I know there's, there's families that it's needed and it's deserved, but we've reached a point that it's become a way of life. And I think it's hurt us now. I think we're kind of reaping the wildfires. They began providing a kind of a job for a whole lot of folks that uh, was called unemployed fathers and so forth, people uh, who had families, Th then uh, they kind of made them a job and they worked at that and certainly that made some difference, uh, that made a good bit of difference to a whole lot of families, families that were uh, really uh, in, in need of some help, uh, got some help there. Uh, I remember uh, very specifically uh, hearing him talk about uh, providing jobs uh, to do community things and, and I thought gee that makes a lot of sense. As I look back on it I don't know that it changed the poverty situation very much however there's, there's still Maybe, I'm, I'm not sure that that war on poverty really was ever won. Uh, I think there, uh, there needs to be uh, some attention given to that and, and uh, I think that sometimes there's too much giveaway and that uh, sometimes uh, there needs to be responsibility that goes with that. Information I would keep for now, the information age, I like that. But from my childhood, I'd keep the peace and contentment and the happiness and the work ethic and the religious aspect, even though it, uh, I've strayed from time to time. 
I'm, I'm a Baptist, and uh, but I would keep I would keep some of those things, particularly the honesty. We never had a lock on our doors. We never locked a door in my life growing up. If we were gone for three weeks, there's nothing we you didn't lock anything, and nothing was ever bothered. I would keep the intercommunications that we experienced in my early lifetime with neighbors and kin folks and so forth. But that limits uh, the broadness of our horizons too, I think probably. Now I have some uh, friends in uh, Canada and, and uh, Washington State and, and uh, uh, Morgan and, and so forth. Uh, and I cherish that also. Uh, and they're kind of opposite in a way. Uh, I think there is uh, some, some uh, questionable activities that go on with, with uh, uh, things that are, I think, alien to the teachings of, of Christ. That, that I wish were not there. Uh, so that, I guess, I, I wouldn't keep. I think that uh, individualism is pretty important, but I'm not sure that a society can live together if everybody's a hermit. To be a little blunt, is they, not, they are not nearly as smart as they think they are. For instance, there, there are some uh, characteristics among you, among us, uh, concern one for another. Uh, you see in the local papers uh, how sometimes a kid, uh, sometimes somebody that's not well known at all will lead some kind of an effort where the community <clears throat> will come together and just really help somebody out that really needs uh, that help. Uh, I think that, uh, I, I, I guess I made up my mind a long time ago uh, that I am not intimidated by uh, those folks who are narrow enough that they would have that uh, line of thought and uh, it, it doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, uh, if they think I'm uh, just a little bit on the dumb side, well, it doesn't hurt me, it just hurts them. I'll tell you, it's about being raised a plain old country boy. I live the fast life, I've been through a lot, Lord have mercy. I've been through a lot, I sure have. All my life I've, uh, I've enjoyed talking to people. I can think back to a lot of things that, uh, I wonder how I made it. You know, somebody had me looking over me, and I didn't have a function to know it, to realize. But I'll tell you right now, the old man upstairs, he's a good man to work with. Lord, I would take nothing in the world for my change in life. Cause I'll see him again. Lately, all I'm getting is leading on my mind. It's all I think about most of all the time. Soon and very soon, I'll leave these troubles all behind. For lately, all I'm getting is leading on my mind. I guess I ought to be looking for a better place to live. I can't get excited about this old world and all it can give. I couldn't care less if I could buy it all with a solitary dime. For lately, all I'm getting is leading on my mind.